for year after year after year after year how many people came out against them is an embarrassment to my profession i gotta tell you the dark side of henry kissinger is very very dark Born in Firth, Germany in 1923, Henry Kissinger was 10 years old when the Nazis came to power. The son of Jewish academics, he was increasingly alienated from the society in which he lived. I think Henry Kissinger grew up with that odd mix of ego and insecurity that comes from being the smartest kid in the class, from really knowing that you're uh, more awesomely intelligent than anybody else, but also being the guy who gotten beaten up because he was Jewish. In 1938, the Kissinger family fled to the United States and settled in New York City. Henry Kissinger was 15. In 1944, just six years after emigrating to America, Kissinger returned to Germany, this time wearing an American uniform. Kissinger was in the counterintelligence corps and was stationed uh, someplace in the American occupation zone. And once or twice we met. I mean, we came out of a totalitarian society. German refugees or Jewish refugees, that was obviously something that weighed on us. We got out early and we didn't suffer the ultimate uh, um, consequences of, of being the enemy in a totalitarian society. When the war ended, Kissinger returned to his hometown, a hundred miles south of Buchenwald. The synagogue where his family worshipped had been burned to the ground. Thirteen of his relatives had died in the camps. Consciousness that societies can take a very evil turn. This separates me from many Americans who have never seen it, can't imagine it. I think you can come out of the Holocaust experience with many different outlooks, but there are two extremes, one of which is you say never again and you have a very moralistic uh, foreign policy. At the other extreme is a great real politic, a realism in foreign policy. Kissinger, of course, had a mix of both, but he was mainly on the spectrum of the power politics player. He believed that in the end what really mattered was power. After the war, Kissinger was admitted to Harvard. As an undergraduate and then a graduate student, Kissinger earned renown as a student of foreign policy. In his writings, he expressed an interest in Metternich and Otto von Bismarck, men of power, cunning, and skillful diplomacy. His grounding was European, not just because he came from Europe, because he, he was a young man when he left, uh, but historically, his intellectual interests, the diplomatic age of Europe. He was fascinated with the art of diplomacy, and, of course, in those days, a lot of diplomacy was secret and some of it even duplicitous. Kissinger's flair for international diplomacy brought him to the attention of Nelson Rockefeller, a Republican politician from one of America's wealthiest families. Dr. Kissinger, having finished the Rockefeller report, we have just learned, too, that the Russians have sent a man 186 miles into the sky and returned him. Would you care to comment on that? It seems to me, to support the recommendations of the Rockefeller report, it indicates that the Russians have rocket engines of very great thrust and probably of greater thrust than we have at the moment. In 1957, Henry Kissinger published a book called Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, in which he argued for a bomb shelter in every house and a doctrine of limited nuclear war. In the New York Times, he received an admiring review from Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. The belief of the Rockefeller group is that we have to go into production on bombers at the same time that we build up our missile force. As Rockefeller campaigned for the Republican presidential nomination of 1968, Kissinger's aspirations moved beyond academia to the seat of political power in Washington. But at the convention, Rockefeller would lose the nomination to Richard Nixon. His political ambition stalled. Kissinger was offered a position in the Nixon campaign. He declined. But he would soon find an unlikely route to power through the Vietnam War. Nixon 
No account of the Indochina Wars is complete without the name of Henry Kissinger. It's one of those occasions where the will to power of an individual really counts as a historical fact. By 1968, Kissinger had visited Vietnam three times and had become an advisor to the Johnson administration. His impression was that the war was unwinnable, but that a withdrawal of U.S. forces would damage American credibility. Accordingly, I shall not seek... To devote his full attention to finding peace in Vietnam, President Johnson decided not to run for re-election in 1968. Johnson's withdrawal left Vice President Hubert Humphrey to face Richard Nixon. Nixon promised that if elected, he would bring an honorable and just end to the war. I would not use atomic weapons in Vietnam. I would not invade North Vietnam. And incidentally, I would not invade any of the other countries in the area of Vietnam. In Paris, representatives of the Johnson administration were negotiating with the North Vietnamese in an effort to end the war. We had been in Paris since May of 68, and we got nowhere. Because, in retrospect, there was only one issue. Was the United States going to get out and be defeated? And nobody was prepared to say, yes, we've lost the war, it's over. Kissinger was an advisor to the negotiators who were authorized to provide him with privileged information. Kissinger was in Paris in September of 1968. I thought he was intelligent, charming, and just a good companion. But what Davidson and other members of the Johnson team did not know was that on September 10th, Kissinger had contacted the Nixon campaign by telephone. We certainly did not know it. Kissinger shared his analysis of what was happening with them, and he was probably by far the most brilliant mind available to them and the most sophisticated analyst. Nixon, as it were, recognizes talent when he sees it. He doesn't like Jews. He doesn't like intellectuals. But he loves Henry Kissinger, because Kissinger knows what to do without being told. Richard Nixon himself says that he admired Kissinger for his ability to supply secret information. Nixon was afraid that a peace accord in Paris might cost him the election. Kissinger notices something. Richard Nixon is prepared to undercut Mr. Johnson and Mr. Humphrey, the president and vice president, and their negotiations in Paris. Kissinger had a very conspiratorial and sometimes manipulative character. He really liked to please various sides. He liked to ingratiate himself. And in the Paris peace talks, he was willing to talk to both the Johnson-Humphrey camp as well as the Nixon camp. Kissinger told the Nixon campaign that the Johnson team was close to an agreement with North Vietnam. Until the deal was final, the Johnson team wanted to keep the negotiations secret from South Vietnam. But Nixon had opened a secret channel of communication with South Vietnamese President Thieu. The go-between was Anna Cheneau. Information, information, information. And uh, knowing that I travel to Asia quite frequently, messages to South Vietnam always gone through me. In late September, Kissinger returned to Harvard. As the election approached, he kept in contact with both the negotiators in Paris and with members of the Nixon campaign. He was getting information from both sides. He probably was giving information to both sides, too. And I don't blame him. I mean, after all, he was not sure which side's going to win. Whoever wins, he's going to go to their side. By the way, Kissinger expected to work for whoever the next president was. <laughs> he offered me a job in the next administration in September of 1968. Really? Yes. Independent of the president's name? Right. On October the 31st, Henry Kissinger called the Nixon campaign to say that there had been a breakthrough in the talks. I've got some important information, said Kissinger. They're breaking out the champagne in Paris. Twelve hours later, the announcement was made. The bombing of North Vietnam would cease and final negotiations would begin. The prospect of peace gave Humphrey a last-minute surge in the polls. And then finally, just a few days before the election, we were moving to substantive negotiations for the first time. And there were great hopes at that time. But just three days before the election, President Thieu defied Johnson and refused to join the peace negotiations. Certainly one reason is the advice they got from Nixon's people. It's clear that they were being told to hold out and not go to Paris. FBI surveillance of the Nixon team's contacts with Tew confirmed this.